Thank you so much and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. It's so great to see that so many of you are joining us tonight for this event. Um, I have to say, I think this is a record number for us. Uh, we've had over 230 registrations, so. Here is a poem from the ninth century poet, Wallada bint al-Mustafi, who was well known for embroidering her verses on her transparent clothes. أنا والله أصلح للمعالي وأمشي مشيتي وأتيه تيها وأمكن عاشقي من صحن خدي وأعطي قبلتي إلى من يشتهيها By God, I am fit for the highest of peaks and I walk and boast in pride I enable my lover to have my cheeks and if someone craves a kiss I provide a poem from 1001 night and Flayla Walayla. Look, my friends, at those luscious red grapes hanging above your head. They are the ruby nipples of a beautiful maiden. Now gaze on the succulent pomegranate round breast, a glow and exquisitely laden. Finally, Al Khansa, the finest woman poet in the seventh century, was once told by the genius poet Nabi Ghazdubiani that she was the greatest poet among those with breasts. She answered him, Yes, I am the greatest poet among those with testicles too. To write the wrongs of centuries, we must brew our own tools. No physician predicted this. Between major and minor notes, an itch of a bird song, and you, my dawn, grinding saffron. Yeah, methane or ashra, pestle and mortar, bury in me your sigh as our soil carries dead in airless secrets, I hold your breath. Centuries persist, men dumb and ink. My saffron grind crushes beard and Bible to dust. All of this embroidered in waistbands, Yazarifa, how I dress you up, petrified in gold thread, sewn by mist. We survive the long hush. I hold your breath. Drench tonight's bed sheets in sweat, wet tip and reaching. We open lips, exhale saffron ink, your cupped hand gathering. They call this lesbian. I kiss your knee, call you comrade. We laugh and the sound is a language that hasn't been written yet. So from writing that poem, I never really allowed myself to write um, love poems or erotic poems before somehow. I, I always found them somewhat, I don't know, in my head I thought that love poems were a pithy thing to write. I wanted to write political work. I wanted to write uh, rageful work. Uh, and I, I realized somehow in writing that poem, another, another one slipped out of my subconscious that had wanted to be written, but I hadn't allowed myself to write. Uh, because it didn't seem to have enough purpose. And then I uh, woke myself up to the fact that my love is revolutionary, that my queer longing is still a fight in all its tenderness. So, yes, I, I'm, I'm going to read a bit about my piece. And this is another uh, kind of thing of digging. I found myself digging into uh, the story of the Golden Arse, which is the oldest novel in Latin, I think. And... It, it's such an ancient story and it's uh, the story of Cupid and Psyche. 
And one of the things that struck me when I was thinking of the piece that I was going to write for this incredible collection was um, that piece, that original story interested me because it really told the story of love of Psyche from the perspective of the people around her, her father, her sisters, Cupid himself, her community. And it was very much about what love was for those people and what love for, of Cupid meant for them. And I felt like there was this opportunity to retell this story from Psyche and what love was for her, but also what other people's love did to her. And so I tried to kind of just disrupt this, this story and root it in something else. So I'll read uh, the first, A Free Girl's Tale. As I look back on my life's trajectory, I see it as nothing more than the articulation of love as shown to us by the gods in both its beauty and most sullied form. Each unique form of love has re revealed itself through my life. The gods have taken hold of my body and very being and made of it an, an eternal story. I am a woman possessed by the divine, immortal in my fate. My love is a manifestation of all loves. My life, nothing but an agent of the heavens there to demonstrate to the people the violence that comes with passion. I could be bit bitter like the citrus fruits that grow in these parts. Love can often leave a woman bitter, but I am not. My life has not been my own. I am merely a reflection of you, a myth to be deconstructed for the instruction of man. For I am not seen as being real, not made from flesh that quivers from a touch blood that rushes from a kiss, or bones that open and fold in the convuls convulsions of passion. And now I sit here eternal, a testimony to former selves, a statue to be marveled at, placed in a museum for others to view from intrusive angles, a, a tale to be pondered and retold, lessons of caution that cross time and space, a painting to be enjoyed. My moment of love and loss immortalized in its detail, a didactic metaphor. I am not and never have been myself. And the what's in the brackets is looking for the gaps in that histor historical record and looking for the, the parts that are untold and unwritten and, and just interrogating that a little bit and asking why hasn't this story been told from, from this, these resources? How can it be told differently? And then using your imagination to do that. And that's the great thing about fiction is that you can use history as an inspiration for imagination without to, to kind of fix some things if you want to fix some things or tell. I had not had an easy day. My dalliance in Paris was coming to an end and I had far too many errands to run, far too many people to see last minute. And then, cherry on the cake, a troubling goodbye with you, my love. A goodbye that lingered for a long while, catching in my throat all day, and I would not at any cost let it rise to affect my eyes, not me. I went home to prepare for my evening. I had already decided what I wanted from the few hours I had left in this city. I would give myself a first time, the kind of present I usually kept for moments of deep distress. I washed my long black hair, stroked it under the stream of water and thought, Mary Magdalene is indulging in her old tricks through me, but this time, I'll make sure she doesn't repent. I stepped out of the shower and a few drops fell to my shoulders. The kind of drops not to be wiped away, that only a thirsty tongue should crave, gather and drink. I outlined my mouth, applied my fragrance, selected the skirt that came to hand, and I also accidentally on purpose forgot to add any knickers. I went to dine with a couple of friends, GNY, at a restaurant where artificial joy was the rule. Two hours and three bottles of wine later, we landed in a swingers club in a basement garage on the Rue du Cherche Midi. 
A man with a mouthful of dodgy teeth was guarding the entrance. My immediate reaction was to turn on the angelic expression I used to adopt at school when the good sisters wanted to scold me for a misdemeanor I had well and truly committed, but was fervently determined to deny. We are good people, mon frere. Allow us to come in. Then I realized my mistake and adopted the opposite expression. We are decadent people, monsieur. You'll not regret it, believe me. I cast a few furtive glances at the promised land behind this highly muscled wall. So much lay beyond that door. Hidden things revealed only to those who deserve them. A consideration following which my expression grew all the more depraved, pouring all the debauchery of which I have been, am, and will be capable of, into a single conclusive look. This door then, will it open for us or won't it? That was the question. G, the guy who had come with us, had meticulously repeated over dinner that I was their passport in, and I secretly dreaded the responsibilities that such an honor would entail, but he was right, for an inspection from toe to top of my worthy person seemed to be enough. The man with the dodgy teeth didn't even get to the level of my face, so needlessly composed, or rather decomposed, given the circumstances. The anti-Saint Saint Peter generously waved us in. We carefully tripped down the steps carefully crossed the last meters of our uncertainty, carefully tore the hymen of our Arab upbringings, a hymen which was, by the way, ever more elastic, at least mine. And here we were inside. I could feel your disapproving gaze following my every step and ordering me to turn back. But wasn't it you who wrote after our first encounter I love the disconcerting freedom that you have, this superb sense of daring. Then let me go all the way to the very end. <laughs> I think that uh, the Arab world has been um, too busy with tragedies and mishaps for the last 10 years, which didn't allow women really to be able to focus on this, especially that we still live in a society where these issues are considered um, less important than other issues. It's always about um, uh, fixing the political life first, fi fixing the economy first, and then we can get to uh, issues like freedom of expression and human rights. And uh, while you cannot fix anything in any country without first addressing the right of each and every person to say whatever they want to say and to be however they want to be. So, um, I will finish um, with a translation of a poem by Aisha bint Ahmed al um, who was from Cordoba and who died around the year 1000 and who never married. And this poem is said to be her response on being uh, proposed to by a male poet. Ana labwatun, lakinnani la artadi nafsi munakhan tula dahri min ahad. Walau annani akhtaru dhalika lam ujib kalban. وكم غلقت سمعي عن أسد. I am a lioness. Never will I let my being be the break on another's journey. But if that were my choice, I would not answer to a dog, for to owe how many lions am I deaf? The first time I saw him, we were with a group of friends, men and women, at a dinner party. 
Metze and uh, Lebanese Arab and chatter and political discussions and risque jokes and laughter. He was doing the rounds saying goodbye to everyone. It was still early. When he got to me, he gave me a polite, distant kiss and suddenly the smell of his body reached me, the smell of desire. I breathed it in and realized that we would meet again and that this smell would fill my lungs and the pores of my skin. Whence springs love, asked Ibn Arabi. I love what fills me with light and increases the darkness deep within me, answers René Shah. Between the question and the intimidate the intimation of the reply, I moved ever closer to the thinker, becoming more aware of the dangerous game that was defining itself in the space between us. Ever since I met the thinker, even after all these years, not a single day has gone by without my thinking of him. I cannot desire a man without thinking of him. I cannot read a newspaper without thinking of him. Every day, something reminds me of him. What, what reminds me of him? Every day of my life is linked to him. With him, I learned to swim slowly, to sink beneath my own undertow, towards the bottom, calmly confident that he was with me and that when I opened my eyes, I would find him there. Open my eyes, I didn't really close them. I tried to remain wakeful, alert, to see him and be seen by him. The first time I saw him, I was in the Metro. I was reading a satirical newspaper. I raised my eyes and I saw him staring at me. He was sitting opposite me, talking with friends. I went back to my reading, but I was distracted. There was something in him that called to me, something in his book, in his look that called to me. Our eyes met again, and that stubborn, exploratory look was trained on me. We got off at the same station. We each went our own way with a last lingering look, but I didn't have enough time to register that look, so I might recall it and try to decipher it. The first time I saw him, he was sitting in front of me at this political conference that I had come to attend. He was with a group of people that I knew. A mutual friend introduced us, and from that, that point on, he did not leave me. He stayed by my side and I felt good. Two, for two days, we did not leave one another. We parted only in the evening, cards each returning to our respective life. He gestured to his throat. It gets me here, he said at the end of the second day for my ears only. Had I heard him correctly? When he repeated these words, I knew that I had been waiting for them. I almost gave that half serious, half mocking look that I used to avoid the issue, but then I didn't dare. I didn't dare play, play with him the game that I play with others. His presence was so complete that it obliged me to answer him. I felt dizzy. How did I know that I had to make my decision at that instant or lose him? I didn't want to lose him. The first time I saw him, I was in the palace with the Palestinian film director. He was in Paris for just a few days and we had agreed to meet at the cafe in the Quartier Latin, known for its Arab clientele. He was with two other men at the next table. I heard something in Arabic about the situation in Lebanon. I could see his face, the two others that had their backs to me. He was opposite me, talking somewhat angrily and his eyes never left mine. As one of his friends stood to leave, he recognized a Palestinian filmmaker. Greetings and congratulations all round. And they put the two tables together. He sat near me and from that point on, never left my side. He talked and laughed as though a sudden happiness had taken him unawares. His bare arm brushed against mine. How many times did his bare arm brush against mine? I'm sorry, I don't usually behave like that, but something stronger than me made me move closer to you, he told me later when I was in his arms. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of anonymous authors here. There's also Najma. I mean, I don't know that there's a point of having an anonymous author if I'm going to out them at the first opportunity. Um, and also we had, um, I think actually to go back to Amy's question about surprises and one of the nice things about having the open call is you've got these pieces coming in which we're looking at anonymous, you know, without the names attached to them. And you'd suddenly, because I've submitted so many pieces to short stories when I started writing, and you'd suddenly get a piece coming through which, um, uh, you'd get a piece coming through which was just so distinctive. Like we had a piece, uh, which is Noor Mahanna's piece, which was set, um, it was a, a Bedouin story set in 
Bahrain uh, in the late 19th century and it was just totally different in spirit. It was a male's narrator po point of view. Um, so there were lovely surprises like that, yeah, all the time, um, constantly. And also just editing a piece, like saying, would this work if you, um, you know, if we, what's going on with the pair of shoes in this, in this um, paragraph? What do they mean? And we get, uh, yeah. And so, yeah. Question there, of actually, from somebody about how, uh, if anybody would like to reflect on if Sadawi had influenced their work. And I'd just like to give a small anecdote on that, actually. In my writing room, which is, which is not this one, it's the one that doesn't have internet uh, purposefully. I have not much but a desk, a carpet, a lamp, and uh, Nawal's portrait uh, sat there. <laughs> I feel that she, uh, the reminder of it, I sit her, uh, and my ashtray, I have this beautiful portrait of her smoking a cigarette, and her ashtray just meets my ashtray on the desk, so each time I sit down, and I'm having a cigarette with her and smoking with her as I write, and I feel like this allows me a lot of, uh, a lot of clarity, you know, to write from my gut and write with my fire, and not with my overthinking. Mm -hmm.